As you may already know, programming is the process of writing code that a computer can understand and execute. And traditionally, we write these pieces of code using text-based languages such as C++, Java, Python, etc. However, there are certain languages out there that are not text-based and instead use visual elements such as icons and diagrams to represent code. They are called Visual Programming Languages, or VPLs for short. With VPLs, programmers can create code by dragging and dropping predefined visual elements on a workspace and connecting them together to create a program. There are a couple of benefits to using VPLs. One, visual languages can make programming more accessible to people who are not familiar with traditional text-based programming, as the visual representation of code can be more intuitive and easier to understand than lines of text. And two, with visual languages, it can be easier to identify and fix errors before running your program. Whereas in text-based languages, spotting a mistake before running your code can be more challenging. In fact, it's almost impossible. If programming were a thing back in Salem and you ran your program successfully on the first try, you would 100% get accused and convicted of being a witch, as the people there would see that as unexplainable and think you made a pact with the devil. The downside to using VPLs is that they aren't as flexible and expressive as text-based languages when it comes to performing very complex tasks. I would like to walk you through a few of these languages, and we're going to run a Hello World program in each of them and see how they vary. Disclaimer. I want to mention that while I was doing research for this video, I found out that some of these languages are not really languages, but more so visual programming tools. I'm just putting that out now before Steve pops up and interrupts me. Let's begin. Number 1. Kodu Game Lab Kodu Game Lab is a user-friendly visual programming tool designed by Microsoft specifically for creating 3D games. It's primarily used as an educational tool, and it introduces basic programming concepts and logic in a very subtle way. Let's take a look. So this is our world. If we want to add an object to our world, we simply use the menu at the bottom and click on the object tool. By clicking anywhere on the plane, you can add an object, and it gives you a variety of objects to choose from. We're going to pick Kodu. Now how can we program him? Or, or should I say her? Wait, what are you? I think I'm gonna say her, as females are the only ones who can be programmed. Women are extremely simple. Women are programmable. Women are blank slates and they're programmed. To my female audience, if y'all are watching or even exist, I want to let you know that was just a joke. Programs in Kodu are created as a sequence of numbered rows. Each row has a win part and a do part. If the win part is true, then the action on the do part will be executed. For example, win see apple do move toward. In this case, when the character sees an apple, the character will move towards it. To display hello world, I can say when timer 3 seconds do say and type in hello world. Now every 3 seconds, Kodu will say hello world. Number 2. Scratch. Scratch is probably the most well-known visual programming language. It's developed by the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT Media Lab, and similar to Kodu, it is designed to help novices and children learn the basics of programming in a fun and interactive way. Scratch has a block-based programming environment where you can drag and drop code blocks onto a workspace, and by connecting these blocks together, you can create programs. The idea behind block-based programming is to simplify code by eliminating the need for users to write code from scratch. They represent programming concepts like variables, logical expressions, loops, and more. And by connecting them together, you can create very complex projects such as interactive stories, games, and animations. To run Hello World, simply drag a C block and type in Hello World. Number 3. Blockly. Blockly is a web-based visual programming environment developed by Google. I was not planning on adding this one to the list because its interface is similar to that of Scratch, as they both utilize a block-based programming environment. But I think it has enough differences to be worth mentioning. One of Blockly's biggest strengths is being able to translate block-based programs to common programming languages, such as JavaScript, Python, PHP, Lua, Dart, and many more. This makes Blockly a more versatile tool for creating programs that need to be executed in different environments or on different platforms. In contrast, Scratch is primarily designed to generate code in its own programming language, which can limit its flexibility in use cases. But both have their own advantages and disadvantages, and the choice between them depends on the needs and goals of the user. Had to put that politically correct statement there in case Scratch developers came for my neck. Running Hello World in Blockly is super simple. In the block palette, find the print block and in it, you type 
Hello World. Number 4. Raptor. Raptor is a flowchart-based programming language designed specifically to help students better visualize their programs. Raptor programs are created and executed visually by tracing the execution through a flowchart. Many of you nerds have already recognized this type of diagram and know that we usually use flowcharts as a way to document, analyze, and design an algorithm or just programs in general. We don't actually execute programs in them, but in Raptor, you can. Raptor begins by opening a blank workspace with a start and end symbol. The user can then add flowchart symbols corresponding to loops, selections, procedure calls, assignments, inputs, and outputs by selecting them from the palette in the upper left corner, and then inserting them at an appropriate point in the flowchart. So for example, if we want to output the text hello world, we will drag the output symbol like so, putting it between the start and end symbols. Then right click, click edit, and type in the text hello world. Number 5. Greenfoot. Greenfoot is a powerful yet user-friendly programming tool that provides a visual interface for teaching object-oriented programming with Java. These two things aren't the easiest to learn, but Greenfoot makes learning both easy from a graphical perspective where you can create, manipulate, and observe objects. Now, in Greenfoot, you do use actual Java syntax. It's a full IDE with syntax highlighting and other tools common to most IDEs. Greenfoot allows you to create what are called actors that live in worlds in order to build games, simulations, and other graphical programs. The world and actors are represented by Java objects and defined by Java classes. The actors are programmed in standard textual Java code, providing a combination of programming experience in a traditional text-based language with visual execution. Greenfoot is perfect for someone who wants to get into programming but doesn't want to use a tool that's too easy, or a tool that's too intimidating like IntelliJ or Eclipse. Running Hello World in Greenfoot is pretty basic as you just use regular old Java syntax. But if you would rather display it to the world instead of the terminal, you can make use of Greenfoot's show text method by specifying the text you want to display and the position of your text on the world. Number 6. Pure Data Pure Data, or PD, is a visual programming language for creating interactive computer music. It was developed by Miller Puckett in the 1990s as a successor to his previous creation, Max MSP. Both of these are more or less the same. Both are flow-based programming languages used for creating music and multimedia works. The biggest difference between the two is that Pure Data is free. Programs, or files, in PD are called patches, and you create them by connecting different objects together, where each object represents a specific function or operation. The two most important objects are OSC and DAC, as they are the backbone objects used to create sound. The OSC object is a sine wave oscillator that generates an audio signal. It doesn't do anything by itself, and that's where the DAC object comes in, which stands for Digital to Analog Converter. It represents your actual speakers. It sends the digital signal from pure data to your audio interface, and as a way to have volume control, we can use this object. This gives us a way to multiply our signal. If we connect everything like so, we can generate a sound frequency. Here's something more interesting. This is a patch that I learned that generates a drum pattern. To execute hello world, we begin by creating a message object and inputting the phrase hello world. Then we use the print object to showcase our string on the terminal. Now if we press on our message, we can see hello world being printed. Number 7. Node Red Node Red is a visual programming tool that is used for wiring together hardware devices, APIs, and online services in a flow-based programming style. Out of every tool I've talked about so far, Node Red is probably my favorite. I don't know how I've never heard of it before. It's perfect for creating IoT applications with ease. Node-RED provides a web-based editor where you can drag and drop nodes onto a canvas and connect them together to create what you call flows. These flows can range from simple to complex depending on the number and type of nodes you use. And there are nodes for like everything. You got network nodes, database nodes, Discord nodes, Alexa nodes, Raspberry Pi nodes, Arduino nodes, machine learning nodes, and many other more. With all these nodes available, you can create impressive IoT applications without the need to spend countless hours coding every individual part of your app or navigating through extensive API documentations. We can run Hello World with just two nodes. We'll use an inject node to inject a message into our flow, and we'll use the debug node to print out our message to the debug console window. Now if we click deploy and click the inject nodes button, a Hello World message should appear in the debug window. Alright, what number are we at? 
Right, seven. Okay, so the last three languages I'll be covering will be honorable mentions. I can't run Hello Road in them as I do not have the necessary tools to do so, but I still want to mention them because I think you'll find them interesting. Now, because I want to stay consistent with the title of this video, here's Hello World being run in three Scratch-like languages. Snap, Pencil Code, and Kitten Editor. Number eight, Pygmalion. The creator of this language, David Smith, created Pygmalion in 1975 with the idea of instructing a computer to do a task in the same way humans communicate with each other. He came up with this idea after engaging in brainstorming and sketching out solutions to problems on a blackboard with his colleagues. He observed that blackboards provide significant aid to communication and thought, why can't people communicate with computers in the same way? Pygmalion consists of creating a series of sketches and icons representing programming concepts such as variables and data structures. The heart of the system, however, is an interactive remembering editor for icons, which both executes operations and record them for later re-execution. Number 9. Sketchpad Sketchpad might be the earliest form of a graphical user interface. This program was invented in 1963 by a man named Ivan Sutherland, and his creation is a significant milestone in the history of computer graphics and human-computer interaction. The program showcased how computers could assist in design and engineering tasks and paved the way for the development of modern CAD software. The Sketchpad system is a general-purpose system that has been used to draw electrical, mechanical, scientific, mathematical, and animated drawings. A Sketchpad user sketches directly on a computer display with a light pen. The light pen is used to move sections of the artwork around the screen as well as to point at them to modify them. The modifications are controlled by a set of push buttons such as erase, move, and so on. Also, Sketchpad is considered to be an early example of an object-oriented programming system as it introduced many concepts that are now commonly used in object-oriented programming languages today. And last but not least, Cube. This language made me feel the exact same way when I first discovered Malboge while researching esoteric languages. Cube is the first visual language to utilize a three-dimensional programming notation. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why? Why would anyone want to program in three dimensions? Well, the main idea behind programming in 3D is that by utilizing all three dimensions, we can more effectively express and represent a broader range of information. Look at it this way. Text-based languages are essentially one-dimensional. They use a stream of words and symbols to encode information. In contrast, visual languages offer additional dimensions for encoding information, as well as a multitude of other properties such as color, texture, shape, etc. Therefore, visual languages are syntactically richer than textual languages. Following this logic, 3D languages are even more richer than 2D languages due to the added dimension of depth which enables better encoding of information. And that is what Cube tries to accomplish. This paper gives an overview of the language and describes the prototype implementation of the Cube interpreter in the programming environment. I'm not going to pretend like I know how any of it works. One thing I do want to highlight from the paper though is how the Cube system uses a mouse as the main input device, which can be a problem because a mouse on a screen only has access to two dimensions. This makes creating a Cube program long and tedious. And the solution to that is the R, where you can use a data glove as the input device. Imagine programming in a three-dimensional programming language in virtual reality. At that point, you're basically Tony Stark. To wrap everything up, visual languages have a rich history dating back to the 1960s and 70s. And in the ongoing future, I don't think visual languages will be up to par with textual ones anytime soon. Now, could that change? Maybe. I don't know. Unsurprisingly, there are a lot of disagreements among programmers when it comes to these two styles of programming. Some find visual programming to be a bad idea, and others find visual programming to be super helpful. At the end of the day, visual languages are good tools to get something up and running quickly and understand the basic programming concepts. But anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know why you think visual languages are not as mainstream as textual ones, except in educational settings. I hope you all enjoyed this video, especially you, the RMR, as you were the one who recommended it. I didn't think I'd be talking about languages again, but here I am. Subscribe if you have not already, join the Discord, and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.